Hello everyone and welcome to Healthy Cooking with Shada. I'm your host and this is where I teach you how to make healthy plant-based meals that are salt, oil, and sugar-free. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please consider doing so. It would really help us and um, we're trying to reach as many people as possible. Today, I'm not going to be cooking anything, but instead I have a special, special, special guest that's on today. Um, without him and his help, I don't know what I would have done. He has truly tremendously helped me uh, for me to lose my 120 pounds. And it wasn't all about um, so much fitness and nutrition as it was in the mind as how he got me there. And he's sneaky. He is sneaky in that way, but he's wonderful. His name is John Pierre. He is the author of two wonderful books, The Pillars of Health and Strong, Savvy and Safe. And today we are going to be talking about the pillars of health, a little bit on it. And we're going to continue these series with John Pierre so that he could teach all of us more and more about it. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome John Pierre to our show. JP, welcome to the show. So good to have you here. Oh my God. You know what I think of you? I, oh yeah. Well, you know. Well, thank you, Shada. Thanks for having me. And I'm always promoting your cooking show. So it's nice to be your first guest on kind of your interview show. Thank you so much. But next, one of these days, I'm going to have you cooking on my show. Okay. What you guys don't understand is JP's always wanting to make black bean burgers. And we've talked about how many years now? Years, forever. Forever. And I keep giving him the simplest, simplest recipes. But, well, what can I say? Have you made any of them yet? Not your recipes. I've monkeyed around with my own simple version. So... My, re my recipes are simple. Well, I know if it's more than a couple ingredients, it's it's a little bit too much. So, okay, my, mine are going to be a, a little bit more than a couple of ingredients, only because you know you by the time you add your spices and you add everything in right. there. So um, anyway, so let's talk about the book Pillars of Health. I absolutely love this book, and I think everyone should have a copy of this book. And if you don't, you can go to my show notes, and I put a link. Uh, to get this book. And then we're also going to put a link in there of, uh, for JP's email and JP's website and all that, where you can also get the book there. Um, what I love about this book is you talk about what it takes, that it takes four pillars to really get to where you want to get to. The first one being the pillar of nutrition, the second being the pillar of the mind, uh, the third, the pillar of motion. And my favorite, favorite one is the last one, the pillar of compassion, which I think that's just huge. And I think that's the, that was the missing component for me was the compassion to being, you know, it's not so much being kind to others, which it is, you have to be kind to the others and kind to the environment and kind to the animals, but also having compassion for yourself. Cause I remember the first time you and I met, you made me cry. And it, was, and it wasn't so much what you said is how you touched, you know, like the, your words were like, it just made me cry because I wasn't being compassionate to myself. So today I'd like to start to talk about um, the pillars of nutrition. If you want to expand on that a little bit, how did you, sure. how did you come up with those four pillars? How did you get started? Tell us more. Well, there, there, there's more pillars than the four, but when my publisher asked me to just start with some basics, those were the first four that I thought would be the most meaningful for people. Right. And for most people, you know, like the, the pillar of compassion, which is the last two chapters, that's the most important, but it's the most difficult for most people to attain. The enhancing cognitive functioning, that other chapter that takes a lot of work. And then the movement one, that's one a lot of people don't want to do. So the first one is the pillar of nutrition, which is really the one that probably will affect people the quickest. And it's the easiest to do because everyone's addicted to you know their taste buds. They, they, they want flavor, 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 and they want stimulation, stimulation. And unfortunately, they've been getting it their whole life. But you know, 92% of our diet is a combination of animal products and processed foods. And both of them have one thing in common. They don't have any fiber in there. They're very, the processed foods are very low in nutrients. And many times they have anti-nutrients in them. So when you take in something like sugar and we consume about 150 pounds of sugar per person per year, that's actually a food that actually robs your body of nutrients. In order to turn sugar into energy, your body uses important vitamins like the B-complex, magnesium, and things like that that help uh, turn that uh, sugar into energy. So you're gobbling up 
nutrients when you eat that. And so we're really addicted to sugar, we're addicted to fats and particularly oils, and then of course salt, and even some flavorings that overstimulate our taste buds, some of these artificial uh, sugars too. So the, the, the nutrition is where we have to start. You know, I've worked in this field for over 37 years, my background's in geriatrics. And so I see what happens when people get older, especially back in the day, when I was in retirement homes three or four times a day, these are people who had good genetics and most of their life they eat, they ate whole foods. So they were eating a pretty good, pretty good diet in terms of getting nutrients. But once they got into these retirement homes, then it became all processed and, and junk foods. And of course, the soil today is so deficient in minerals, they were missing all that important minerals. So diet is so important, but it's really the easiest one to do because you know whatever you reach for, there is a healthy alternative. So as you remember, Shada, when we first started, some of the junky and unhealthy foods you were eating, I would just give you some alternatives. So everybody likes sugar. I like sugar as much as everyone else, but like for me, you know, I have my fruit bowl. So I have some cherries, I have apricots, I have peaches. So I still get the sugar and the flavor that, that, that you get, but you're just getting it with fiber and water and nutrients, but you're still getting those receptors you know, you're getting that dopamine blast when you eat these foods. So why not just transition to a mango or a peach or a cherry or some dried fruits to get your sugar fix? It's going to be healthier for you. And you're, you're going to have more vitality. And the more that you care for yourself, the more that you're going to want to care for yourself and you boost your self-esteem. So I start out with getting people to start cutting back on sugar and adding natural sugars. And just like we did with you, if you remember, that was so long ago when we first started, we made that transition very gradual. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember that. And you made it very simple and easy. And I didn't have to do it overnight. So that was that was really good. Exactly. You don't have to do this thing overnight. You just transition slowly. So when you want a piece of cake, you say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to have a peach first and then maybe some cherries. And then if I want my cake, I'll have it. And that's fine. As long as I got the good in you first and then you want to have the bad, that's OK. And your childlike brain says, hey, he's not stealing my cake. He's saying I can still have it, which you are. It's just that I'm giving something good, healthy first. And then you have the option if you want to have the unhealthy food. Yeah, but you're also tricking us because by the time we have the fruit first, you're like, well, I just ended up putting something really good and nutritious and healthy in my body. Why do I want to put that cake? And half the time, you don't eat, you're full. You're already, your stomach is full. Yeah, it's true. I'm not, yeah, I don't really, I'm, I never really try to, I'm trying to trick people. I would try to give them options. Right. And I don't want to take things away from people. I will always want to add in because my philosophy is the more good that you put in, the less bad you'll ultimately tolerate. So, so if you hang around, if you have kids and they hang around with a bad crowd, they get used to that crowd and they get used to doing these and they get used to certain terminology and vulgarity and ideas. But all of a sudden you put those kids in a good crowd and they adapt, they adapt right into that fine. And it's the same thing here. I'm not going to take your candy and your hamburger away. I'm just going to ask if you could eat this first and then go ahead and eat your candy and your hamburger if you choose to. Right. So what's the biggest challenge you face working with most people today? Well, that's interesting because it's not a, it's not a, it's not very easy with most people I work with because most people have a lot of depression and anxiety and they have a lot of cognitive issues going on and they're very desperate for help. And unfortunately that often breeds in them this magic potion. They think, you know, they'll see me at a seminar, they'll hear me, you know, doing a program like this and they'll, they'll hear all these people I've helped. And they think that they're just going to do a session with me and I'm going to take a magic wand and boom, they're okay. They don't realize it was only that easy and that quick. Exactly. And I've said to people before, I said, look, if I could just do one session with somebody and they'd be cured and healed of their food addictions, I'd stay up, you know, fifth, you know, I'd work all day long and travel around the world doing this, helping people. But it, it takes a lot of work. So I think the, the biggest challenge that I face working with clients is they have no concept of how much work this ultimately takes. You know, I work a lot with therapists as my clients and I see the trauma and many of them are trauma therapists and I see what they have to go through and how long it takes to help clients, you know, get, get rid of depression get rid of anxiety and get in alignment with themselves. It's not an easy task. No. And food addiction is just as nasty as any other addiction. In some ways it's the worst because there's not always so someone shoving a bowl of cocaine or heroin in you in front of you, but there is somebody always shoving food. You go to the, the, you know, I don't, you go to a hardware store and there's candy 
when you're checking out. There's candy everywhere. And every time you meet with somebody, they want to go out to eat. So food is just omnipresent. And it's not it's not just healthy food, it's all junk food. So the biggest challenge would be, I don't see people being realistic. They have to realize this takes time and it's gonna be a slow process. And what I've always told my clients is look, slow and steady and just make little tiny improvements every day. Like you're going up a set of stairs. We're not looking for the elevator to go from zero to 20. It's not gonna, that doesn't work that way. I wish it did. Do you think it's gotten worse because of the pandemic? Well, that's an, invoked a lot of uh, anxiety and depression and, and, you know, people lose hope when they see what's happening, not only with the pandemic, but also the catastrophes with the environment. Uh, yeah. And that's caused social isolation. And, you know, that all feeds into it. Sure. But I think the thing that really causes the problem is these unrealistic TV shows and models and celebrities you look at and people say to me, well, hey, I've been doing this for a week and a half and I haven't lost 25 pounds. It's like, what? I mean, one pound of body fat's 3,500 calories. If you and I work out hard together, we're lucky to burn 200 calories. So it's not like, you know, people are going to be losing weight that quickly. And most of these people are dealing, unfortunately, with a lot of cognitive issues and depression and anxiety. That stuff doesn't just go away overnight. It takes constant reprogramming because a lot of my clients are 50 and 60 and 70, and they've been programmed since they've been a kid by family, friends, society, the media. It's not going to just take one or two sessions with a therapist or a coach to, to heal you. I, I, I wish it would. So so yeah, the biggest challenge is people that aren't realistic and they don't realize how much work this takes. Okay. But I think you're living example because when you first, when I first met you, I did one session with you and I never saw you again, right? Oh man, you're going to bring that up, why didn't yeah. you? <laughs> yeah, and so how come I didn't see you ever again? You said the first session you cried. So I think you realized that this is in-depth stuff I'm doing with you and it's going to take yeah. work. And then your mom saw me and she asked me, how come I don't, how come I abandon her, her daughter? And I yeah, said, abandon your daughter. What are you talking about? She never called me back. And that's true. I didn't call you right. Because like I said, you started to hit a nerve and I didn't want to go there. It was emotions that I just didn't want to deal with. I just, I guess I'm like the rest of, of everybody else that I wanted a quick fix. But then exactly. when that first session, you just went there and I don't even know how you did it, but you did it. And it just, I'm like, whoa. And I'm like, okay, no, we, we got, and I told my mom, I'm like, no, 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 don't, don't, this has nothing to do with JP. It's completely me. Um, and I will call him back. And it was the best decision of my life to, to work with you. And I think uh, you're absolutely wonderful because you don't, you don't belittle us. You don't punish us. You don't talk down to us. You, you're very compassionate in how you handle the whole situation. And I think that's huge. We're, a lot of these nutritionists or dietitians or gurus, they're not compassionate people. They're not compassionate to the other person's feelings, whereas you are. And that's, that's, it. that's huge, absolutely huge. Well, and I think also when you work with somebody, you know, what, you know, who's inside, what's inside here is who they are. You know, like when you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out because that's what's in the orange. So if you're working with me, you're going to get what's inside, which is compassion and love. And so some people will say, well, you know, it sounds intense, some of these things. I'm really not intense. I just get very excited about stuff. And I give you facts. Like I say, that's the sun or that's the moon. I'm not making a judgment on it. I'm just giving you the science and the facts and let's work on it together to help you. Uh, but I can't, I can't sugarcoat it and tell you, you know, like Dr. McDougall always says, people want to hear good news about their bad habits. And that's very you know, true. Yeah. And I can't do that. I can only tell you the truth. And I'll say to you, hey, this is going to be hard, but I, I'm here to hold your hand and work with you and, and be there for you. And hold your hand. People, everybody, I'm telling you, he does hold your hand. I ended up staying in Los Angeles an extra, what was it, two or three months, because I literally did not want to let go of this man's hand. And I was so scared to move that I literally paid an extra three months for me to stay in LA until I can continue working with JP so that I can get comfortable and coming back. I don't, you remember that, right? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. I remember for sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, what you did, I think this is perfect for the audience to hear. You did the first session, you got scared. You realized, oh, wait a minute, JP's not going to just cast some magic pixie dust on me and I'm going to be healed. He wants me to work. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I, I wish you didn't have to work. You know, it'd be great if you didn't have to, but I don't know any other way to do it. And 
I don't know anyone else who works with people that has a better and easier way. It just no, takes work. And it was the best decision of my life. Best decision. Um, I know you work with clients emotionally more than anything. Why do you think that is so important? Well, I mean, that's where the, the crux of the issue is when somebody is overweight, you know, and that's not something I necessarily just focus on, but for your audience to hear it, it's, it's a good analogy, but there's a reason that they're overweight. It's not because they're eating too much broccoli slaw. It's not because they're eating too much, you know, celery and hummus. It's right. because they're eating too much processed foods. And the reason why they're eating too much processed foods is because they're trying to fill a void that's inside. They have a sensation that they don't like, whether it's depression or loneliness or whatever it is, guilt, a shame. And so they numb themselves with food. And thank goodness they do it with food because I'd rather have them numb themselves with food than with heroin or cocaine because they both work the same. It's just that the repercussions from food are not as dangerous immediately as they are from these you know, street drugs. So it's, it's, it's most of the stuff has to be addressed emotionally. You just can't give somebody some nutritional strategies and say, go eat this way. If that was the case, all these people could eat those this way. It's not that easy because they're having some issues uh, that need to be addressed also. What I like to do is show people that there's foods that you can overeat on, which I'm not suggesting they do, but they can, that will numb them and take away some of their pain that don't have the repercussions that the drugs do. And then eventually when they become more stable, we show them how they can cut back on some of those foods and just eat more of whole food diet without as many as these foods. And they're relying more on essential oils, um, meditation, uh, yoga or stretching and exercise, healthy, loving relationships, volunteer, things that also bring them pleasure. Because remember when we were kids, Shada, you couldn't drag us in the house when we were kids to eat our meals because we were so busy playing and having fun with our friends, right? That's absolutely true. Yeah. But people are, basically people have a, a, a deficiency of fun and connection with one another. And once we can get people connected to one another and then eventually to themselves, we don't have the desire to want to take drugs anymore, i.e. processed foods. That, that is absolutely, I remember something you said that has lasted with me even up until this day. You once told me that you can't fix this until you fix this. Yeah. And I remember that to this day, it's almost 11 years, guys, but I still remember that you have to fix, in order to fix this, you have to fix the mind. And that is so true. That was, that was one great advice. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot, I work with a lot of professional people uh, people in our industry who are leaders that, of course, have written books and do programs on nutrition and fitness and well-being, and I still work with them. And that's there's a lot of people in our movement that are leaders that still have food addictions. So don't kid yourself and think that everybody in our movement that's out there teaching doesn't have food addictions because it's omnipresent. Most people do have some food addictions and it's nothing to laugh at. It's like any other addiction. And it's something also to take very serious because it can derail not only your health, but it can derail your, your relationships and your family and your working environment. Um, it's, it's a serious problem. You know That sugar that you're taking in and these oils, these are refined products that your brain doesn't recognize. It doesn't understand it. It only understands this massive amount of neurotransmitters being released just like a drug would alter your brain chemistry. And so it's, it's a serious problem that needs to be addressed uh, in a loving, kind way, but it has to be addressed with more than just diet alone. I know there are some, uh, some people in our movement that don't believe in food addiction, which it boggles my mind. Like, how do you not buy into the food addiction? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, if, I mean, I guess I would ask the, the, that particular, the, the, that group, do you believe in cocaine addiction or alcoholism? You know, do you believe you can be a sex addict, a kleptomania? So, you know, uh, I mean, I, I'm not here to argue with people. If they have a system that works and they're helping people, bless them. Uh, I, I work a lot with therapists as my clients and they're often trauma therapists. So I, I, I definitely have seen the damage that these things can cause and I believe in it. So. No, I, I get it. So what's your take on uh, smoothies in general? Because I know, you know, you can do green smoothies, but from what I see, is like people put so much fruit in there that the vegetables like this much is tiny little bit and then this much of it is all fruit. And to me, it's like, right. 
Well, that doesn't make sense. So what are your thoughts on smoothies and what's your favorite way of making smoothies? Yeah, well, what was interesting, I was doing a seminar once and the, probably one of the best doctors in, in the world was in front row and with his wife and they were you know, anti-smoothie. And as I addressed the audience, I got to the part of my talk where I was gonna talk about smoothies. And I looked down at them and I said, just give me a chance. <laughs> And I talked about smoothies. And when I was done, he came up to me and he said, brilliant, JP. He goes, that was, that was handled very well. Because there's a place and a time for everything. Now, my background's in geriatrics. And one of the things that I've seen the most is malnutrition in, in these seniors. They, don't, they can't masticate very well. They often have dental and gum problems. They have poor hydrochloric acid and digestive issues. They often have a zinc deficiency. They can't smell. So they're not inclined to eat as much. So that's a problem because they don't get a lot of nutrients. But if I put these foods, fresh fruits and vegetables, maybe nuts and seeds in a blender and we make it into a smoothie, suddenly every gulp that they take is like a whole bowl of fresh fruits and vegetables. So there is a way to use smoothies in a proper way. And then there's a way that can cause issues. Um, I, I use smoothies predominantly uh, for my clients who tell me they don't have the time to eat the big bowls of salad or the big bowls of broccoli and Brussels sprouts and things like that. I use them always in geriatrics, always with the elderly, and I use them quite a bit with children that um, don't eat that much as it is. So every gulp they take of a smoothie is gonna be very beneficial. Traditionally, depending on who I'm working with, I'm, I'm working with an athlete that has a high caloric need. Some of these athletes can burn five to 10,000 calories in a day. So their smoothies are much higher in fruit and fat. Uh, for most people on average, just to give you an average, the smoothie is generally uh, a vegetable-based smoothie, so mostly vegetables with a little fruit, particularly a high antioxidant fruit like uh, organic blueberries or wild blueberries. And then um, you, a non-dairy milk, of course, or you could use water or coconut water. And then maybe a little bit of seed, like a um, chia seed or ground flax seed. But it's predominantly mostly vegetables, and it's kind of sipped. So a lot of times when I make a smoothie, uh, I might make it in the morning, but I might not start eating it till later. And then I kind of am sipping it for, you know, two, three hours until I have maybe my first real meal in the afternoon. Do you, uh, would you consider a smoothie um, as a meal replacement? Yeah, well, it is a meal. I mean, there's no difference. If you, if, if you put all those foods on the table, that's a great meal. All I'm doing is putting them in a blender and it's the same thing. Nothing has disappeared. In other words, the fiber is still there. The nutrients are there. If, by adding frozen um, fruits or vegetables, you're maintaining a little bit of cool temperature in there. So things aren't heating up as much, which is good. And some blenders have um, vacuum seat, uh, vacuums on them that can help prevent oxidation. But for most people, I'm not that worried about that. I just want them to get more fresh fruits and vegetables in. So talk a little bit about, um, because I see people doing this all the time, like they'll take their smoothie and drink it really fast. And then yeah. people that drink it really slow. And I know you are on the school of you need to drink it slow. Why is it that we need to drink it slow? And what happens if we do drink it really fast? Well, it's like anything else. When I work with people that are trying to change their life, one of the things that most people need to do just to slow down in general, they're just at too fast of a pace. They're used to the internet. They're used to their phone. They're used to images blasting on the screen and reacting quickly. Everything's fast paced and we have a slow attention span. I know that people are going to eat three times a day, if not more. And one of the ways I can get people to practice mindfulness and meditation is when they're eating. So if they could use a spoon and take a little bit of smoothie at a time and be mindful of it, not only does that help with them being directed for mindfulness, it helps your digestion because you're taking a lot of nutrients and putting them in the stomach. And it's good for the stomach to be able to process that a little bit till the next one comes in. And remember too, when you're dealing with a lot of greens, you're dealing with a high level of chlorophyll and chlorophyll eaten too quickly can give you a little bit of um, like nausea, can get a little nauseated. So, so eating slow and Drinking slow is, is definitely important. And there's some exceptions for athletes and military. They have to learn to eat quickly, especially if you're an athlete running a triathlon and you're drinking or eating what you have to, and same thing with the military. But for the most part, eating at a slow, moderate pace is something we all should work on. And it's something I still work on too. Okay, so for someone who wants to lose weight and wants to start doing some smoothies, how should they get started and what should they put into their smoothie? Well, I, again, I normally, as you know, never really talk about weight loss, because if you remember when you're working with me, I always said, look at weight loss as a byproduct to healthy living. 
right? Yeah, right. So in order to get healthier, how would they transition to doing a smoothie? Well, yeah, first of all, I'm not suggesting they do a smoothie if they don't have to. If they're willing to sit and eat the big salad, take their time, eat the broccoli, the asparagus, the Brussels sprouts at a slow, controlled manner, fantastic. But if they want to have a smoothie, again, I'm just using a non-dairy milk or coconut water or water as my base. And then I put in organic blueberries or wild uh, blueberries as my power fruit. And then I'm putting in a handful of either spinach or sometimes chard, sometimes kale, um, uh, any, any side of dark green in there. And then I usually use um, a, a seed or a nut for them. So maybe a few walnuts or some chia seed or uh, when, you've ground, when you've ground flax yourself, put a little bit of that in there. And then they can put in some spice. Like I like to use sometimes cinnamon or pumpkin pie spice in there. And then if they want it a little bit sweeter, say it's a child or it's a senior, then go ahead and put another sweet fruit in there, whatever fruit that would be. Like if you like mangoes or you like bananas um, or cherries or whatever you like, I try to eat as locally as I can. Not everything is going to be local, but right now the farmer's markets have all the peaches and apricots and cherries. So I, I use that in my smoothies. Oh, yeah. So I don't, it, it doesn't have to be really complicated, but right now it's, it's more important. You have a smoothie that's a little sweeter and you're more inclined to eat it than make it too alkaline and you won't like it. Okay, perfect. Aaron tells me that we've got some questions from our viewing audience. So oh, Aaron, okay. what are some of the questions that you have? All right. You're going to need to talk a little bit louder. <laughs> and who is our questions from? If they have a name, that would be nice too. So it's Sen. Senji, I've, Senji. Um, I've seen a trend in drinking soaked chia seeds as a way to cleanse internally. Is this just another trend or is it a real way to cleanse or detox? Yeah, so well, soaked chia seeds are great. And I use um, chia seeds quite all the time in my smoothie or flaxseed. And I also make a, you can make like a pudding with them. Um, you can, I've, I've uh, also used them just in, um, like juice, you can add it to juice and it thickens up. So it slows the absorption of some of that carbohydrate in terms of cleansing. No, I wouldn't say that there's any sort of mystical magical, magical cleansing. I think, um, cleansing is a term that sells a lot of products. And I think the idea is once you wash your car, keep it clean, you don't wash it and then go drive through the mud. So a lot of people will, will clean, go on a so-called cleanse and then go back to eating crappy. So the idea is to eat a whole, a whole plant-based diet. So you're eating fresh fruits and vegetables, maybe whole grains, nuts and seeds, legumes, potatoes. Those are all good foods that will keep your body cleansed. Um, you don't need to go on any sort of mystical, magical cleansing program. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, we got plenty. We got a lot of questions. <laughs> this is you. great. So, um, so Janice said she saw you talking about movement, um, sneaking or adding movement and all through the day with weights, et cetera, and equipment like hand weights in every room. What exercises do you recommend and how much? Well, again, the exercises or movements to be more accurate that I recommend are based on what the person's physiology are. If they have a shoulder impingement or back problem or, you know, stiff, they're stiff. Uh, that's how I kind of decide what would be best for them. So, but just in general, I'm not saying this is for you, but ask yourself this question and be honest and fair. How many times just today have you taken your hands and put them over your head? So if it hasn't been a couple dozen, we have some issues because we know we get a lot of problems where we see people when I'm flying, they're trying to take this 50 or 60 pound suitcase and put it in an overhead bin and they blow out a rotator cuff. They haven't lifted their arms over their head at all during the week, and they definitely haven't done it with a load. So we need to make sure that we know this is a ball, and technically it's a ball and saucer joint where our hip is a ball and socket, but it's the most mobile joint we have, and it's designed to go in all these different directions. So it's hypermobile, but it doesn't have good strength because we don't work on it enough. And most people don't even have the flexibility anymore because it's so stiff because they're never moving it. So we want to get used to some arm movements overhead. If your physician says it's okay for you to do that, if you have an impingement issue or something, then not. But I try to get my clients to get their hands over their heads. I try to get my clients to do some pushing movements, maybe some push-ups off the counter and some pulling movements where you're pulling a band, uh, you know, attached to a, a, a bar or something stable where they can work their back. Because most of us have very poor back muscles, especially, especially the erector spiny muscles that are next to your spine. And that, that helps keep us up. 
because we have a tendency to have this forward kyphosis. We're always on our phone or computers. And so that's a problem. So um, if you go to johnpierre.com, on the very bottom of my page, there's a just sign up for the newsletter and right away it automatically sends you a free video, an exercise video that I talk about all this stuff in detail for 20 minutes or so. That's wonderful because one of my questions to you was how important is exercise for weight loss? Well, that's a good question. Exercise for weight loss is that's not the reason to exercise for weight loss. If you're trying to lose weight, again, a healthy living lifestyle is going to help you get there slowly but surely. Exercise or movement, to be more specific, is for many reasons, but particularly it's for your self-esteem, because as you start getting stronger, you start feeling better about yourself. And as you feel better about yourself, you're more inclined to take care of yourself more. That's one. Number two, we need it just to keep our bones and muscles firing and functioning. Once you get over 40, it starts to go a downward spiral. And so people get that sarcopenia where the muscles start atrophying. They get the osteopenia or osteoporosis when the bones are no longer stimulated. So you need to have stimulation. And just, of course, movement alone helps with brain-derived neurotrophic factor, kind of the, the brain's fertilizer that keeps everything healthy and sharp in your mind. It also helps our lymphatic system, which is our immune system, that keeps everything, you know, it's like your body's paramedic and police department, keeps everything healthy. So it's only really chronic exercise that really contributes to a massive calorie deficit. Most of the calories you're burning throughout the day come from what we call NEAT, N-E-A-T, or non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which basically just means all the movement that you get throughout the day that's not a workout. That's where you're burning most of your calories because you can only work out about an hour a day. But it's when you're getting out of your chair, you're going for a quick walk to the water cooler, you're getting in and out of you know, that bed or your positioning, you're moving around. That's when we're burning calories more uh, statistically than just our workout. I remember uh, you told me that I should sneak in movement if I'm watching TV, that I should get up at every commercial and start exercising or start doing some kind of movement. Do you know how many commercials there are? Oh, exactly. Yes. I was like dead tired. But exactly. If you watch TV, you know, and uh, you know, just a, one show is going to be about 15 minutes of commercial. So you can sneak a lot of stuff in there, you know, and just something as simple as taking the cushion off your couch when you sit down allows you to squat down deeper and when you get up you have to get up it takes more flexibility more strength when a commercial comes on just get on the floor go on to your hands and knees and you can do just hold that posture and then try to get back up again that's a biomarker of aging that's how well we tell if people are aging well how, how fast they can or not so much fast but how efficiently they can get off the floor so there's a lot of ways to sneak it in there's a lot of ways. I know you got me like when I was on the phone with you, I'd be marching in place. I'd be doing yeah. the steps, the box steps, going up and down the stairs. Or um, there's so many exercises you had me doing. And thankfully, you know how much I love exercising. Yeah, you love it. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I have to do it. And, um, and I remember I was in a boot when I first met JP up to my knee. And I was not allowed to do any kind of exercise. I could not put any pressure on my foot whatsoever. What I did not realize that I would be getting one of the hardest workouts from this man, John Pierre, sitting in a chair. And maybe we did cardio kickboxing. Oh, and then we did cardio kickboxing to on top of it. And we also did the TRX. Yeah, yeah. we did everything. Yeah. We work around people's injuries and you were supposed to have surgery on your, on your leg, correct? On my, on my ankle, I was supposed to yeah. have surgery. And you told me that if I stick with you and I do exactly what you tell me to do, you promised me that I would never, ever have to have surgery. And to this day, I never had it. But I did tell you to check with your physician first. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> make that clear. But yeah, yeah you know, you, you did, you had a really great work ethic. And that's, again, when people see you and they say, I want to, I want to be like Shada. I was like, well, if you want to be like Shada, it's going to cause a lot of sweating and a lot of, you know, work. It's just that Shada just didn't keep 120 pounds off for seven years, not working. No, I, I'm, I'm what you call a very highly conscientious person. And so yeah. that, that's, that's definitely it. Um, I think Aaron has a, questions. a lot of more questions. Great. Keep them coming. <laughs> So somebody wanted to know, JP, uh, Janice wants to know about your sanctuary. Would you mind sharing a little bit about what's oh, in the Sure. 
So, um, you know, livingwithharmony.org, you can check us out our webpage and you can follow us on Instagram. We have great posts all the time or Facebook. And basically our nonprofit is, it's an animal rescue and mini sanctuary. We also have a team we work with that rescues kids in trafficking outside of the country. And then of course, locally, we do farmers markets where we're doing education. Um, if you go to planetbasedlivingfestival.org, that's a big conference we're having up at the end of August, planetbasedlivingfestival.org. And that's a conference that um, we do for the environment. So our organization is about teaching compassion and love, rescuing animals, rescuing you know, kids in trafficking. And then we do a lot of work locally in the community uh, especially picking up lots of styrofoam and plastic from vendors so we can take it to get it properly recycled. Because a lot when you're dumping your styrofoam in the garbage, it's going in the garbage. We take it to a facility that compresses it and then they, they sell it to be reused again. Perfect. Uh, so here's a question. Um, uh, what types of food would be good for nighttime leg cramps or maybe even some movements? Oh, sure. Well, generally leg cramps, you always ask your physician first. They're usually mineral deficiencies. And usually the ones that we have problems with are magnesium and potassium. Most of us get enough sodium, but someone that is following an SOS-free diet, salt-free, all-free, sugar-free, and exercises, they could be low in sodium because you could be naturally just low in sodium. Shade, as you know, uh, yeah. people can be naturally low in sodium, but if they exercise and they sweat a lot, then they'll even be lower in sodium. So if they're not eating their chard or their tomatoes or their salary, and they're not eating foods that are, are you know, a little higher in sodium, they're going to run into an issue and they're more prone to cramping. Magnesium is generally found in green leafy vegetables and some nuts and seeds. Um, and potassium is always just fresh fruits and vegetables. So those are the main ones that cause the issue. Some people do well if they take a, like a magnesium glycinate supplement with helps their cramps. But generally, if it's in your calf or foot, of course, ask your physician, but it's usually a mineral deficiency. The other problem is there's a lot of people that run into hyponatremia where they drink too much water and it dilutes their sodium out. That's why you see a lot of marathon runners or anorexics they can die, their heart can stop because they are you know, deficient in the minerals. Uh, they, they've, they've diluted that sodium particularly so low. Okay, let me see if Aaron has any more. Do we have any more questions? We do. How, uh, so this is from Sanji. JP, how do you feel about things such as supplementing spirulina or chlorophyll, beneficial, necessary, or a waste of time? Well, no, I think, I think especially chlorella is really a great, if you want to use the term superfood, I think the company um, Health Force, you guys can see it here, it's the one that I really like, and they're all in glass bottles too, which is great. They make a great chlorella, and they also make a, a smoothie mix that has chlorella and spirulina. One of the problems with spirulina, even though it's a, it is a great superfood, so high in chlorophyll and protein and so many nutrients is a lot of times chlor um, spirulina can be can contaminate it. So you have to make sure you're working with a reputable company. But I think both of those are great foods. And I'm a little different than some of the other people that think we get all the protein we need. I don't necessarily think that we necessarily always get the protein we need, especially believe it or not, as people get older, they're not eating as much and their bones, you know, you're, you need more than calcium for your bones. You need protein too, and vitamin C and boron and everything else. But I, I'm a big believer in getting digestible, easily assimilable, uh, assimilable uh, sources of protein. And for some people, beans and grains don't work well in their digestive system. So I do use chlorella or spirulina for many of those people. I kind of like them in the smoothie um, every so often, just if I don't, if I don't use, um, or I don't have a lot of fresh greens, which I usually do, but if I'm traveling, it's fun to put it in there and it really makes things green and your, your teeth get all green. It's, I kind of like it. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> so Kriti wants to know, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting and getting enough protein in if one has an eating window of six hours? Yeah, um, well, there's, there's pluses and minus to intermittent fasting and there's different, you know, some people start at noon, some people start eating at two, there's different ways and some people end at six, some people end at eight. So it's just a, a time restricted window. I think the challenge with time restricted window is it forces you, which I don't necessarily think is a good thing to eat a lot of food in, in a short amount of time. So that can often be hard, hard on your digestion. 
I think the advantage of it is then it doesn't leave you a lot of window to go and overeat. So I think you have to find what works for you. Um, but in terms of the question on protein, again, um, not everybody can break apart grains and beans as easy as everyone else, especially if you have poor digestive issues. So chlorella and spirulina, things like that are helpful too. Um, but I do like intermittent fasting. I personally, you know, I try to eat later, not always, but I, you know, depending on my schedule, I like to eat later in the day, early afternoon, and I love to finish by six. That's ideal, but that doesn't always happen because of my schedule, but like 12 to six would be great for me. Um, but that doesn't always happen. Okay. Oops. <laughs> um, so have you ever considered yourself a food addict or have you had a food addiction? <laughs> JD? No, oh. no, I don't think that everybody's a food addict, but no, I, 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 I think, you know, if you watch my zoom series, if you go to johnpierre.com on the top there, they'll say the pillars of health and it's a zoom series. And the first video that I do, that's 17 hours and Dr. Furman's in there, Dr. Marbus, Brenda Davis, you know, and then I brought all these people on that none of you know, because I wanted to bring people outside of the nutrition world. But one of the first videos I do, we talk about food addictions and what I say in there to sum it up is you're allowed three dopamine blasts a day from food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but the rest of your 20 dopamine blasts better come from life. And so I think if you do that, you're not really going to be prone to food addiction because again, it's like when you're a kid, you're so busy having fun doing other things. Your parents have to pull you in and force you to eat because you're having so much fun outside of the house. So I think, you know, for me, I'm running an organization. I'm doing a lot of charity work. I'm taking care of all these animals. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm busy with my own, you know, work, you know, professional work. So I'm pretty busy. The last thing I have time to think about is, is, is really food. That's not on my, on, on my radar that much, but and there's, I don't, I don't make a judgment of somebody as a, a food addiction. Um, I think there's, it's pretty hard not to have a food addiction in today's day and age where we have high levels of anxiety and stress and depression and who wouldn't medicate? If you get hit by a semi truck, you want morphine to take away your pain and bless you for that. Well, if you have anxiety and depression, you want to get out of that. And so you reach for the easiest thing, which is food and it's processed food. Generally, it's not, you know, broccoli slaw. When you're um, eating chia, do you want to grind it up first? Um, you don't have to, if you soak it, you can soak it and then it puffs up. It, 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 it forms like a, a gel, which is kind of neat, which is nice because if you're trying to change the absorption of sugar in your system with a smoothie, it thickens it up very similar to flax. Um, and they're both great sources, of omega threes. Um, so, you know, you don't have to grind it, but I, I like I personally like to soak it. I like to let it sit for a while. So like, if you put your, your, non-dairy milk in the blender, then go ahead and put your chia seed in there while you're chopping and fixing and everything else. Give the chia a little chance to gel. Okay. Um, so, um, so we are told it's, that it's harder to drop weight as we get older. You've taught me the importance of sleep. Do we need to get more sleep or can we, or is too much sleep detrimental? Well, barely anyone gets enough sleep. Um, you know, in our society today, we're all big into these self-help books and success books and biohacking. And everybody's bragging that, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the money world, hey, you know, when, when, you're, when I'm up at five doing this and that, my competitor's sleeping. It's like, that's so silly because, you know, there's a part of your brain, um, you know, the glymphatic system, which is similar to the lymph system throughout our body. And the glymphatic system helps regulate cleansing out amyloid plaque that happens in between the cells, the, the neurons. And it's when you're sleeping that this flushing takes place where the neurons shrink and the cerebral spinal fluid is flushing and removing some of that amyloid plaque. So when you're sleeping, you're healing, you're repairing, you're regenerating. Sleep is, is one of the greatest things that we can do. As you get older, oftentimes there's problems inside the brain with different um, organs or glands and there's just different issues that go on with elderly and they don't get enough sleep, but they still need sleep. So I would never cut back on sleep unless you're, um, you know, severely depressed. Some of those folks can, can, you know, go and stay in a bed for 14, 15 hours a day. And I'm not saying they shouldn't, but many times they just need some motivation or coaching to be able to get out of bed, you know, something to live for. Okay. And then one last question. Um, do you recommend any daily supplements? 
Well, that's a good question, but it all depends on, again, what somebody's doing and who they are, their own biochemical individuality. I think we really can't get away from taking B12. I think it's kind of a universal supplement that not only vegans need for sure, but even people in the meat world that are over 50 and aren't going to absorb due to something called the intrinsic factor that gets secreted and slows down as you age. So I think everybody generally talk to your physician, but everyone should be using a B12 supplement. And I, you know where I run into an interesting challenge is when people say they don't need to take vitamin D supplements. And I think that's a great thought, but my question is, well, if you don't take the supplement, where do you get it? And they'll say, well, I get it in the sun. I say, well, you do, but Joe down the block and Mary down the block that work in a box, their office, they get to work when it's dark and they leave when it's dark. So where are they getting their vitamin D from? So I think there's certain situations where, yeah, we need certain supplements, you know, like DHA. That's always a big debatable thing. Well, how much walnuts and how much chia and how much flax are you eating? Suddenly, you know, you're not eating that much. And so maybe you're going to be lower. Uh, it's hard to say. Um, a lot of the studies, you know, in our movement, there's lots of vegan physicians that are 50-50. Some say, no, don't take it. Some, some say do. So you kind of have to do your own research and look at the physicians out there and what they recommend in some of the studies. But I would say just in general, always check with your physician. But in general, vegans can be low in iodine. They can be low in B12. They can be low in vitamin D. And they could be low in DHA. Uh, one of the omegas that's very important for brain and cognitive health. You know, one of the biggest cause of, uh, of challenges cognitively is this DHA deficiency. That's why in formula for infants, it has to be put in the formula. It has to be because the baby's brain and retinal development are dependent on, on DHA. So whether you should take it in supplement form or rely on your body converting uh, when you eat flax or chia or walnuts into this long chain fatty acid, that's debatable. But if you look at some of the big names who do recommend it, like Brenda Davis, Dr. Greger, um, Dr. Joel Furman, you know, and then you can rec and look at this, some of the physicians who don't recommend it and maybe make that decision. But for me, when I'm working with clients, uh, B12 is pretty much non-negotiable. I mean, it's, I, I, there's too many permanent neurological problems you can get from it. And you only need small amounts of micrograms in it. And it's a microorganism really in the soil. So unless you're eating you know, carrots pulled out of the, out of the ground without washing them or drinking well water and not washing your hands. It's really hard to get B12 in a sterile environment that we live in today. And these are easy enough that you can go to the doctor and have him test you on so that you know where your numbers are at. Yeah, you can. He or she can test you and see, you know, um, on some of these levels. Um, I think though, if, if, you know, B12 is like, uh, geez, you know, it's, it's one of the things that does help them, the myelin sheath along with DHA. So it's, it's something you don't want to monkey around with. I've had clients that weren't taking B12 and I found out they were having numbing of their toes and fingers and cognitive issues. And when I asked them, well, how much B12 are you taking? And they said, none, I got them on B12 immediately. And those symptoms went away, thank goodness, but it can cause some serious problems. So I don't know any physician out there, especially in the vegan world that doesn't recommend B12, but always check with your physician. Yeah, I agree. Now you touched on this subject a little bit. So tell us a little bit more about your nonprofit. Oh, sure. So living with harmony again. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much where all my work is. You know, I, I don't even give out my website as much, you know, johnpierre.com. I give it out, but if somebody, if I could get somebody to go to one, it would be the livingwithharmony.org because again, that's all the rescue work that we do. And that's all the environmental stuff we did. I just talked at a conference in Ohio, the NHA conference. And one of the lectures I did was called planet-based living. And that's a, a term that we coined because it's making decisions based on what's best for not only you, but the planet and the animals. And so that's one of the main things that we constantly talk about is, you know, how we can take care of the planet. Now, we've been talking about this forever. And everywhere you go in the news today, you see the doomsday clock is almost at midnight with the environment and we need to take action now. So there's a lot of good Zoom programs on there for free and resources. And our Instagram is really good because we have we make posts every week and you'll learn a lot just from those. Wonderful. And how can people donate? Yeah, if you go to livingwithharmony.org, there's a donate button. And we appreciate everything because we have so many rescued animals that we take care of. And that's where all my money goes. You know, I live a very simple life. You know, most of the clothes that I get 
Um, I have friends who are professional athletes, so they they give me their clothes all the time. Um, I buy things from the strip, uh, the thrift store all the time, other than you know basics like underwear and socks or shoes, but everything else. And so I live very simply, but my money goes back into the charities. Now, not, not only mine, I, I donate to other charities too. Uh, other people that I know that do great work, um, I donate to that. I just choose to live simply. And, and one of my big philosophies is, is, you know, Alice Walker said, you know, activism is our rent for living on earth. So I think we all have to ask ourselves every day before, before we go to bed, you know, what do we do for the planet? I, I did that as a kid. When I was a kid, I would go to bed and say, what good did I do in the world today? And I'd list it mentally, bullet points. And then I would say something very important. I'd say, well, what good can I do tomorrow? So I was always programming myself to do good and to figure out how else I can continue doing good for humanity and the planet. So if people can't donate, then do, do, do good in the world, you know, become, you know, become an ambassador of good in all your actions. Um, and then if you just send, say somebody that's too much work for them, well, then just send people my website, just send them to livingwithharmony.org. And that's a great form of activism right there. But you definitely want to do something every day for someone or something other than yourself. Well, that's wonderful. And I know for myself, the way I donate is through Amazon Smile, because I've got your charity on there so that whatever I spend on Amazon goes to you. Uh, so yes. maybe you, want, you might want to talk to our audience yeah. about that. Well, it, it goes to my charity. It doesn't go to me. But yeah. I mean, it's something really easy and we're all yeah. shopping on Amazon. So why not make our money, make it work for us and make it have it go to a good cause? Yeah, thank you. Um, if you go to Amazon, they have a, a tab there or something for it's called Smiles and they'll donate a portion of every time you order a portion of your what you spend goes to a charity of your choice. So my gosh, you better pick some charity. Just no need for Amazon to get any more money. I mean, bless them for having products available, but they're they're doing fine. And ours is Living with Harmony, and we're in Boulder, Colorado. So you'll know you got the right one. Uh, but yeah, the little bit, you know, every time we get a donation, any amount of money that goes to feed the bunnies or take care of a turtle or take care of you know some bills for the animals, we don't keep any of it. None of it goes to us. And if you go to JohnPierre.com and you click on JP's favorites. There's a lot of products there that I like that are, are um, affiliate links. So that means that if you click on it, we don't sell it, but you'll get directed to the website of the company and then they give us a donation or a, a percentage of your sale. Um, so that all adds up. You know, we're a charity. We are in desperate need of money all the time. We're trying to get a property uh, anywhere in the United States, but preferably if we could get one out near Colorado would be ideal. So we could have a, a larger sanctuary and run retreats and educate and, and teach people about, you know, simple living and being a good, a good person. I'm selfish. I want you in your Belinda, California. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I've been, I've started to travel a little bit more, you know, things are opening up. So I'm doing more lectures at conferences and I love doing lectures at um, like businesses, you know, that I really like, because then I reach so many people and it's all about reaching people. But, you know, I do have my Zoom programs. I have a couple Zoom programs on johnpierre.com and that one that's 17 hours. I mean, that's unbelievable. Shady, you you were part of that. Yes, I was. And that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. And there's some great stuff. And again, that whole program isn't just nutrition. There's all sorts of things. We have podiatrists coming on talking about your feet. We have therapists coming on. We have meditation experts. So it's a lot of good information. So I'm all about providing information. I really don't sell anything. I mean, I have my books for sale, but I don't really, you'll never really see me out there hard, hard balling people to buy that stuff. It's out there if they want it. I don't see why they wouldn't get it for whatever it costs, $15 or something. You have to realize when you buy somebody's book, you're taking whatever, some of these doctors have been doing this for 40 years. You're taking all this information that they've learned and are trying to present to you in a book and they're charging you whatever it is, 15 or $20. I mean, that's, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's priceless information. So books and videos and audios, I think are really important for us to keep motivated and stimulated. But once you get the information, then it's not about keep getting, collecting data, it's taking action on it. And you know the difference between knowledge and wisdom is knowledge is really the accumulation of data and wisdom is putting that information or data to use. Right, so I know you're busy and, and I really appreciate all the time you've given us, but I do have one final question because both Aaron and I have been dying to know, will you have another retreat like you did in Chicago? I know we were scheduled for one, but when the pandemic hit, it just kind of canceled everything. But 
things are starting to shift. So we, the two of us would be there in a heartbeat, but now I need to know, will we have another retreat? Well, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process right now of trying to get some people to help me that will put it on if they can do the leg work and stuff. Cause I, you know, it's all a lot of work as you remember, but that was an amazing retreat. And we got, we couldn't believe how good the food was. You know, we thought that was going to be the hard part, but it was actually at a facility that is where nuns and priests go to school. That's where they learn. And it was beautiful with the lake and it's, it was in Chicago. So yeah, if you're interested, definitely go to johnpierre.com, click on the very bottom where it says the newsletter and you can make a comment and say, Hey, I'm interested in the retreat. We're, we're definitely trying to do it again. So if we can get some people volunteering to help me put that together, I'd like to, but it sure was a lot of fun because it's a way for people to be able to spend four or five days with me and, and some other instructors in a very intimate setting where we can work on some, you know, pressing issues and more emotional stuff. And it's not so much all on nutrition as you remember, Shada, you know, we covered nutrition, but it was almost not, in, not in a hardcore way, but prerequisite that you have some basics nutrition down. And that's what I loved about that conference. It was a small, intimate group. I believe we had, what, 55, 60 people? Yeah, it was small. It was small, which I loved. We got, I got to meet everybody. You got to hang out with everyone. And you made it, you made it a very safe environment for people to get up and to talk about themselves, to talk about their stories, to talk about their struggles. We were laughing. We were crying. We were, I mean, every emotion. We all went through it together and that bonded us that to this day, I'm still friends with a lot of those people and right. you don't find that at too many conferences because a lot of the conferences you go to, there's 200, 300, 500 yeah. people there and everybody's just doing their thing. But this was so close and intimate and personal and you're a wealth of information and the people you had there were a wealth of information. And I personally, I can't thank you enough for that retreat. It was it was one of the best retreats I've ever been to. Yeah, thank you. I keep hearing that from people. So I, I was really proud of that. And I was so happy the food turned out because that was, you know, the SOS free is not really easy. So, you know, cooking salt, oil, sugar free is not easy. And whoever who knew they'd be able to do it so well. You, if you get what I've noticed is that with people, if you give them the basic idea, you give them the basic recipes and you don't make it so hard on them, you give yeah. them a little bit of a leeway. Well, not in the salt, oil and sugar, but I'm just saying, OK, we're talking potatoes. Yes, sweet potatoes is the best, but OK, they have white potatoes. OK, so what? You're talking white rice they have, but they don't have brown or black. OK, so you eat white rice. So as long as you make it easy on the chef, they're more than happy to do it because what chefs love to do is to get in the kitchen and be creative. And right. now you've yeah. given them this whole thing of here you go, go be as creative as you want within this parameter. And I think yeah. it's a phenomenal job. It was really nice. Well done. Well, yeah, well, well, thank you. Thank you. And I encourage everybody to watch a lot of your other shows too, because you know, your wealth of information. And as I told you, you can help more people than me because you had the food addictions, you had the weight issues, you had the self-esteem issues, you had all these issues and you overcame them. And so I can only talk and teach on the science of it without really the practical experience that you had. So I think you're doing such a wonderful service with these, you know, your, your YouTube channel and helping people. So thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to, we're going to have, if you're willing to come back, we're going to do more series. And you and I are going to delve in more into the my weight loss journey and how we, you know, we did everything. And I can't wait for you to come back. This was absolutely wonderful. I can't thank you enough. And you know how much I love you. And if people, if you guys are not following John Pierre, you really should be uh, following him and check out his website. Check out his organization. He's just amazing, absolutely amazing. John, thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for helping everybody as much as you do. Okay, thank you everybody for being here. Be kind to be loving. Thank you. Bye. How was it?